Our first speaker, Dr. Lenore Walker, is a professor at Nova Southeastern University Center for Psychological Studies. She's the coordinator of the Clinical Forensic Psychology Concentration for Doctoral Students, training to be clinical psychologists, and her um, emphasis is on battered women and abused children developing trauma-specific programs uh, for those populations. She is frequently called upon to be an evaluator or an expert witness in family, um, civil, perhaps even criminal um, court proceedings throughout the United States. She's the executive director of the Domestic Violence Institute, which has um, satellite centers throughout the US and the world. She's a prolific author. Don't know where she finds that kind of time. She's currently the president of the American Academy of Couple and Family Psychology of the American Board of Professional Psychology. She does workshops and presentations on a very regular basis, has to turn down many um, such offers, so we're very, very fortunate to have Lenore with us. When I was personally in family court hell or family court purgatory, which is more optimistic, we called upon Lenore for help. Lenore was a longtime colleague of my father's good family friend, and uh, her exact words were, when my dad called her, Nick, I will help you, but with the promise that when this is over for your family, you'll join me in the fight. And Lenore, we're making good on that promise. <laughs> So at this time, please welcome Dr. Lenore Walker. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, as Janet said, this conference has been in planning. Uh, the conference itself has been in planning for over a year. And I want to thank all my wonderful speakers uh, who have all agreed uh, to participate in this conference at no cost. There are no fees that are being paid. So you can imagine we have the passionate as well as the brilliant thinkers uh, who are going to be speaking with you. Uh, we purposely put together uh, people from the legal profession and people from the mental health profession uh, because we constantly point fingers at each other when we look at the problem saying, well, if only uh, the evaluator was better, or if only the judge was better, or if only the lawyer was a better lawyer, or even if only the, uh, one of the parties could afford uh, a lawyer or an evaluator. Uh, and uh, that is true, uh, but I think it's a much bigger problem than the individual professions themselves. And so I titled my talk, The Seven Deadly Sins uh, in the Family Court System, because I really want to point out uh, what some of those problems are. Um, the fact is, there are a lot of custody evaluators who should not be working in the courts. There's no doubt that my own professionals um, are put a shame and a blight uh, on the mental health system. And I know most of them are good people and try very hard uh, to do a good job. Uh, so those of you who are doing that work, um, we're failing. And I consider myself failing. I do the best I can do, but I don't have all the tools that I need, and I really don't have all the answers by myself. And I know that there are a lot of good judges, and I know that there are a lot of judges that ought get off the bench. Or they certainly should not be sitting in court because they don't have the temperament and they don't have the knowledge. I'm thrilled that we have judges that came to this training. But you know, most of the conferences that I do all over the world, judges won't come. 
Now they will come if I come to them. If I go into court and I go into their court conferences or I go into the, the judicial college conferences, they'll show up there. But this isn't about one profession. This is an interactive approach. And we have to learn together to find the solutions to protect children. The same thing for doctors. We don't have too many doctors who will come to these conferences. Um, we have Dr. Neuberger, who is going to be speaking with us, a pediatrician for many, many years, um, who has been working on these cases. But his colleagues don't come uh, to the conferences. Mental health professionals need the CE units, and they come. And I do go to doctor trainings and where they get their CE credits. So they do get the information. But the fact is, we're not talking to each other to try to find the solutions. We have some recent research, and I'm not going to give you all the statistics. I'm going to give you this morning a broad outline of where I see the problems uh, are. And then our speakers are going to, one at a time, be able to tell you it from their perspective, from the work that they have been doing in the field, uh, working uh, in this area, and knowing the academic literature. I tried to find people who knew both. Uh, who could give us uh, that combination, because it isn't just enough to see it from our own small perspective. We have to know what other people are doing all over the world. This is not just a problem in the United States. Um, my husband, Dr. Uh, David Shapiro, and I train every year in Spain. Uh, we've been doing this for the last seven years, and the problem is there. Uh, we, I've been training in Israel. The problem is there. Um, and uh, in countries, you'll hear other people. I was in Hong Kong last year working on a case, and the problem is there. And you will hear um, uh, from Judge Fields after me, who was training in other countries uh, as well. And I'm sure other people have. So it's not um, of our individual faults. And as Janet asked you, I'm going to ask you to please um, suspend your judgmental beliefs for the next two days. Don't think about what um, you want it to be um, or what it could be if somebody else did such and such. But think about where am I at in this uh, area and what do I have to offer? Um, what do I have to, to think about as we put it all together? And hopefully by tomorrow afternoon, when we have a, um, all the panelists together on a big reactor panel, uh, we can come up with some ideas, some solutions. I just want to remind us all that um, this week, <coughs> excuse me, um, the courts uh, in Virginia dinged Virginia Tech millions and millions and millions of dollars finding them negligent in failing to protect those children on that campus. And they are people's children. Uh, who are on that campus. I say this conference throws down the gauntlet. We are going to put on the record why what's happening is bad for children. And if we don't become part of the solution and force a solution here in this country, we may go to courts with it. And people have been going to courts. Judge Fields, who you'll hear from afterwards, was one of the pioneers in New York City as a legal aid attorney who took the um, city in court um, with failure to protect battered women and their children back in the 1970s. So <laughs> she's still fighting <laughs> and still feisty. We still have civil rights attorneys because this is a civil rights issue. This is an issue of failure to protect women, children, and some men uh, as well. So let's talk a little bit about um, <coughs> where we're going. Um, I just want to tell you some of the figures that I've been learning as we've been inviting people to the conference. There are some studies that haven't even come out yet, and there's a wonderful study uh, by the National Institute of Justice that was uh, the principal investigator was uh, Dan Saunders, uh, where he found that the uh, education was helpful uh, in the changing attitudes, but the attitudes that existed 
with judges and with custody evaluators found that a large percentage of them do not believe women when they claim that there is abuse in the family and do not believe the children when they claim abuses in the family. And for those who believe what the person are saying in their court, they don't think it matters that much when deciding access to these children. That's a national shame. And that's something we really have to change. Why it exists that way is what we're going to explore so that we can really figure out some of the changes. A more recent study done uh, by Dr. Geraldine Staley and the California Protective Parents uh, Coalition is even more significant. 81% of the hundreds of women that they studied uh, in their research came to the court after a divorce had been filed with a custody dispute, came to the court where they had always been the custodial parent. And 50, over 50% 50 of them left the court with no access to their children. That's a shame. It should not be. It should not be for the sake of the children. Those of us who are child psychologists know that taking the child away from the mother because the court doesn't believe the mother um, where the, uh, and the, there's abuse in the family is totally destructive for the children. So why? How does it happen? Well, I think the first um, slide, and I've got control here. There we go. The first slide um, is going to tell you the first of the deadly sins, the seven deadly sins. And the first sin, as I see it, uh, is that there are systemic errors in the court system itself. It is flawed. And no matter how good any of us can be, those errors are going to prevent us from protecting children. And that's really what this is about. The first in family court are the, the presumptions that we have to work within in most states. And I could even start back even earlier and say the first biggest problem is that we allow state by state by state to make these kinds of rules about access to children. Perhaps we ought to look at a national standard. Perhaps we, one of the things we need to look at is seeing if we can't get Congress, although I'm not exactly sure that the current Congress can do anything like that, but get them, especially because of the war on women that seems to be uh, being fought daily. They can't even pass the Violence Against Women Act without um, uh, extending it without problems. But. Be that it as it may, it may be easier to persuade one bo legislative body than 50 legislative bodies to put in the, the, and re remove some of these presumptions that are so dangerous uh, for these children. Um, the first one uh, is that in most of the state's um, uh, sets of uh, family laws, there is a, some sort of clause that talks about reunification or, if not reunification, which is in the dependency statutes, uh, it, in the family court statutes, talks about keeping the family together. It is in the state's best interests to keep the family together. I teach a course in um, psychology and family law in our forensic psychology concentration at NOVA. And in that course, I started off every semester with these mostly young, very bright, eager um, people at the uh, age where they're all looking for marital partners or at least some kind of partner. And uh, they, I start off by saying to them, marriage is not about love. Marriage is a contract between you and somebody else and the state. And it is in the state's best interest to have the two of you take care of each other 
except, of course, if you're in the same sex. And then uh, that is not uh, in the state's best interests, as we know, although if they were smart enough, uh, the legislators get off of all of their other politics, they would realize that it would fit within the um, areas of why we have all of these laws surrounding marriage and dissolution uh, of marriage. So it is in the state's best interest because if you take care of your partner and your children, then the state doesn't have to do it. And that's just the bottom line uh, in, in our legal uh, documents. We also now have the presumption that shared parental responsibility or joint custody or any other name by which you call um, the uh, giving equal access to children by both parents is in the best interest of the child. Well, as a scientist and a psychologist who knows the literature very well, there is not one empirical scientific study that says that it is in the child's best interest to be with both parents when you have one parent who has got an abnormal ability uh, to go after power and control and abuse. There is not any study that says that that child has a right to be abused. So that presumption um, needs to be taken out, in my opinion, of the uh, legal systems. A presumption, for those of you who are not that familiar with it, means that this is what is supposedly in the best interests of the child, and anyone who wants to change it has the burden of proof to, to prove why they want to change it. And in most states, the burden of proof is not just that it isn't good or it isn't in the best interest of the child, but in many of the states that I work in, you have to demonstrate that it's detrimental to the best interest of the child or you have to demonstrate that it will cause irreparable harm to the child. These are extremely high burdens uh, to prove, especially when you're doing an evaluation with children that may appear to be extremely resilient at that particular moment. Or when you're doing an evaluation and the parent who's asked you to do the evaluation does not have financial resources to go further with um, demonstrating that in the court. And another systemic error, which we'll talk about later, that's not just a systemic error, it's really a violation of due process, is the trend in family courts not to have court reporters take down all of the um, uh, information going on in the court or not taking it down and not transcribing it. And if the parties do not have the money. The last several court, um, cases that I testified in, I was shocked to find there wasn't even a tape recorder recording it. It was only the court, uh, the judge who was taking notes. Not that there was a problem with the judge um, taking those notes, but that r only lets it be seen through one person's eyes rather than having the whole um, transcript in front of appellate courts that might be able to remedy some of the mistakes that could be getting made. Although I think Dr. Uh, Judge Fields is going to tell you that, and, and um, uh, Judge Lerner Renner are going to tell you that um, the appellate courts rarely reverse in these kinds of cases. The next presumption, which is, is one that we find um, very much against children, is that the friendliest parent is going to be the best parent to get custody if shared custody is not appropriate. So um, if the uh, abuser, who oftentimes is quite charming in the courtroom, comes in and presents himself as being extremely friendly, and the mom, who's being a protective mother, does not want to allow the children to be with the parent who she believes is abusing the child because the child tells her so and doesn't want to be there, she is not the friendly parent. 
And so now the presumption is it's the other person who gets the custody of the child, no matter who's the real, quote, psychological parent uh, of the child. Another presumption that really is, is well-meaning but needs to be uh, thrown out because it is not working uh, properly. And then the last one is the presumption that the biological parent is always the best parent, which is an old throwback and um, does not understand uh, that um, non-biological parenting through adoption or through um, uh, marriage uh, may be the best parent for the child and it may be in the best interest of the child to be with that parent. Uh, but that parent, uh, both in dependency court and in um, child custody cases, uh, rarely gets a fair chance uh, in the courtroom without spending um, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, the amount of money that is spent in these cases uh, is really a shame. There are also contradictions. So those are just some of the presumptions that we face daily when we're in family court. There are also contradictions um, that really have no answer because they're both very strongly held beliefs, sometimes the strongly held beliefs in the same person. Um, and that is that the best interests of the child should be primary and privacy rights should be primary. That we should not open up the doors of our family and show our secrets. And so people are, are fight for privacy and at the same time fight for the best interests of the child. Well, you can't always see what is in the best interests of the child and I'm not so sure that best interest is a very measurable standard uh, as a psychologist that has tried to measure best interests because what's good for one child may not be good for a child at another age. And so that standard itself needs a lot of research um, where we can at least look at, does it make sense? Can, I mean, it sounds good. Uh, we like what it says, um, but is that really the best standard? And furthermore, is it the best standard when we have abuse allegations uh, in the family? Uh, and I, I present to you it probably uh, is not. Um, the last area with the due process violations I'll talk about a little bit later on, uh, but the last one I want to mention before I move on to the second deadly sin uh, is the issue of money in the courts. If you don't have money, you don't get justice in most of our legal system, and that is true in family court as well. Um, some have suggested that perhaps the court should hire evaluators. But having worked in courts where they do have their own evaluators, I s suggest to you that that's not necessarily a good suggestion uh, because the courts will cut costs immediately on paying evaluators. And so the people who end up doing this work may not be well enough trained, may not have the sophistication and the understanding. Because the bottom line is that very few cases of people who have children who get a divorce ever go before the court for a custody determination. We make all our rules, all our laws, all of our psychology guidelines based on the fact that these are going to be, quote, normal families. But normal families tend to settle their differences on their own. The people who come to the court for guidance are the people that cannot settle it on their own. And thinking that we can do um, the settlement, um, uh, we are uh, if thinking that we can do the settlement with an, a custody evaluation may be a pipe dream, maybe a nice pipe dream, but it may not be um, possible for strangers who come into people's lives with predetermined biases uh, of their own can really make those kinds of determination in perhaps. Um, maybe 10% of the cases that get into the court, that need the court's attention. 
uh, and those 10 percent uh, so overload the court docket uh, that it's almost impossible uh, to give the attention uh, that the cases need to be able to be settled fairly. It takes me over two to three days to do a comprehensive evaluation and then another month or two to let it settle, to look up things, to go to the research, um, to write up a report, to really get it right. I then go back to my clients, have them look at the information to make sure I heard it correctly or I interpreted it correctly for another 10 to 20 hours working on one of these evaluations. And the court expects to be able to do it in less than a day or two. It simply cannot happen that way. So the, the, the system itself is flawed in expectations that just are not uh, going to happen. Uh, I can tell you in one of the cases that I testified in not too long ago, uh, the judge gave each side 15 minutes. How can you present your case in 15 minutes? And when something came out on cross-examination that hadn't been told before, the court refused to hear it because it was time was up. The person used their time up. That's not justice. That's not due process. And that's not doing right by children. We also um, want to look at evidence. All my lawyer friends love to talk about the evidentiary rules. So we've had to learn, psychologists have had to learn, what are the evidentiary rules? Well, evidence is usually based on facts. Women don't think that way. We have plenty of research, psychological research to know that women mix facts with our feelings. Those are how we, that's how we live. So when we're being asked to separate facts from emotions in the court, it's very difficult to do. And the legal profession doesn't understand that or doesn't want to understand that. They want to try to separate them out. Well, there are ways around that. You can change evidence. We did that with battered woman syndrome uh, in cases where women killed their abuser in what they claim was self-defense. Um, they were only supposed to look at that particular act, according to the evidence, the criminal codes in most states at that time. And we went before the legislatures eventually, although some of it came case by case, and demonstrated that you couldn't look at just one episode. Domestic violence is a pattern. It's a pattern of an abuse of power and control. Sometimes it's with actual physical violence, sometimes with actual sexual violence, and sometimes you don't need to have the actual violence because like bullies in the schoolyard, threats are enough to scare someone. And that's what it's about. It's not about one fact or one act. So when you get stuck with evidentiary issues, um, not being admitted into the court um, because uh, allegedly they, they are not accurate, then we have to go back to the legislatures and change uh, what the evidence requirements are. We also have a problem with things um, that are not written down. Women who are raising young children often don't have the time or the facilities, the, the resources to write everything down that happens. And when you're emotionally upset, it's also more difficult to write it down until it sort of settles for you. So oftentimes, women don't come in with the, um, he did this on this date, and he did this at that hour, and he did this at another time. And so if it's not written down, we, I've been told in, in courtrooms, we don't have to believe it. Only in writing do we believe it. And sometimes the batterer understands that and comes in with pages and pages and pages of all of his problems with what she's done. Not that she hasn't done it, but the inequality in what the evidence is in front of the court makes it very difficult to be able to come up with an accurate finding. And then the last part, which is, I think, even more important for psychologists, is that we don't always understand that children are resilient. 
And when they know they're going to have to spend time with a person who may be also abusing them, they will concentrate on the loving part of that relationship and not on the abusive part of the relationship. And they are more resilient and can cover it up, and you will not know the truth from the child unless you really are willing to take the time and the appropriate way of interviewing and talking with the children. Um, I do believe that not have children not having the voice in the courtroom is one of the systemic errors uh, in family court cases. Um, children should be represented. Um, they should have legal representation. I just heard that California uh, has uh, passed a, um, I don't know if it's a law or just a, a, a rule, um, is it a law? Um, saying that the children now can, the judges can now talk to the children. Well, I think that's great for some judges, but I'm terrified <laughs> with some other judges. Um, so, I, I, uh, and, and I understand psychologists are now, we're now gonna be the ones who are gonna be training the judges. Good luck. Uh, I, I suspect we're just um, uh, a, a good idea, but I have a feeling that that kind of a solution um, is not enough, is not enough. Lawyers know how to talk to judges, and judges know how to talk to lawyers. But the rest of us um, do the best we can. And sometimes the judge makes it easy for us, and sometimes the judge really makes it very difficult because they have a million rules uh, and can cut us off at any point that they want to. And um, sometimes the children can feel real comfortable with a judge. And some of the judges you hear today, um, I think, would be fine with kids. But uh, some of the judges that I've been in front of, uh, I don't want to be in front of them. <laughs> if I have to go back in their courtroom, I'm not so happy about it. <laughs> um, OK, so uh, the last um, uh, piece is, is uh, with uh, parenting uh, plans. Um, this is the latest that we have in Florida. Oh my God, my husband is telling me we're, we're running out of time. This is the latest that we have in Florida, and I have to tell you uh, that, um, again, having um, non-psychologists make, um, thank you, <laughs> having non-psychologists make um, a pl parenting plan with parents that can't agree about anything else and with uh, somebody, one party, who wants more power and control and will take it away is going to be doomed to failure as well. Um, these parenting plans are no better uh, than uh, what the old um, uh, uh, court did was say, you're the parent, you have the responsibility of deciding how you are going to parent that child. And by trying to force them into parenting plans is taking away the opportunity and the power of the parent to supervise children. It's not so bad when children are young, but as they get older, um, they're taking away the parental authority is only going to get the children into more difficulty with having to go to other people for the authority of, what they're going, of, of whether they're right or wrong. So uh, lastly, moving on to the, the I'm only on the second sim, but I'll go pretty quickly through these. The, the last one, uh, is uh, the fact uh, that the best parent in an abusive situation may be, may be one parent with the other parent having no contact with the child. Why? Because we know enough as psychologists that if the child has been in any way affected by the abuse, then that child will have symptomatology of PTSD. They may not have a full-blown PTSD, but they will have symptomatology of it. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder repeats itself even when that parent's not there. There are triggers to trigger the effects, and the parent, it's himself, usually himself, will become the trigger. And so that, parent, that relationship between the child and that parent will never be free from producing PTSD symptomatology. And so it may be dooming that child to never have a relationship with that parent by forcing 
the parenting at that at the time that the uh, dissolution is occurring or the evaluation is occurring. And um, the statistics are pretty scary. Very few courts will refer, and very few custody evaluators. And by the way, custody evaluators and the courts in the Saunders study I mentioned earlier have similar opinions, um, whereas ad domestic violence advocates and legal aid attorneys have much more similar opinions to believing that children are being abused and women are being abused than judges and custody evaluators. So um, we have to somehow make it understood that the majority of the cases that are going to be coming before the court will have abuse in those cases. And what we have to be able to sort out is how do you figure that out? Well, let's quickly look at uh, oh, I'm going backwards. Okay. Um, the f second deadly sin is not ridding ourselves, and that means all of us, of our stereotypical biases that we come to when we do an evaluation or when we try to help adjudicate uh, these kinds of cases. Um, and uh, if I had more time, uh, I would spend it with you talking about gender issues and about um, civil rights issues uh, and the worldwide um, uh, uh, issues around gender that are being studied that we don't hear very much about in the United States. Um, but around the world, there are commissions on gender. There are, are um, in the cabinets of governments there are areas that look at the systematic biases against people because of their gender. Uh, and that's something uh, that happens because it's women who are being disbelieved. It's protective moms who are being disbelieved in these, in these cases, as well as the children. Uh, you can see that some of what we need to look at is changing the stereotypes of who's the good enough woman, who's the good enough mother, who is the good enough father? Who is the good enough man? What do these sex roles um, and gender roles have to do uh, with it? Um, that influences the kinds of decisions that are being made both in the custody evaluation and in the courts. I can't tell you how many evaluations I read where the um, uh, evaluator takes the exact same behavior that he or she sees in the man and in the woman and writes a comment about how strong and how wonderful it is that the man is doing X, Y, and Z and how bad it is that the woman is doing the same exact behavior. That's gender bias. That's, and, and when I am asked by the boards of psychology to review the complaints, that's the first thing I scan the report for, is the language that's being used. And I know that Toby Kleinman is going to talk about some of that language uh, tomorrow uh, in her talk, because it's critical. It influences our language and our influences our thinking. Our thinking influences how we conduct these evaluations and, and what we do with the results of them. Third deadly sin, ignorance of child development. Anybody who has not got the theories of child development clearly understood, and that means lawyers and it means psychologists or other mental health evaluators should not be doing these evaluations. Um, you can have copies of these slides as, as to uh, why I say so, but the bottom line is that you miss what the kids are telling you. You, Jeff, you don't understand child development. You miss what they're saying. You miss what they need. Uh, and, and that's a huge problem uh, uh, in the cases, not only with child development, but also the ignorance of child abuse. Um, David and I just finished a case uh, where a psychologist wrote in the report and testified on the witness stand that um, this child um, could not have been harmed. She was uh, three years old. There was no physical injuries to the child. So there was some sex play. Um, that doesn't harm children unless the child um, is physically injured by it. 
that is total ignorance. I mean, uh, he, sh he should lose his license for being a psychologist, and the saddest thing is he was hired by the Board of Psychology in that state um, and offered that opinion. Um, children disclose in a variety of different ways. There are wonderful guidelines that are produced by um, APSAC and some other organizations. APA's guidelines are sort of wishy-washy, um, but uh, they can at least help us a little bit uh, in how, how to do it. Judges need to learn what's in a good psychological report. Lawyers need to know what's in a good psychological report, and they need to not hire their friends or the colleagues, but they need to hire the people who are the right for that particular situation. Uh, and we need to be able to, to um, help the legal systems, the psychologists. We have to not just go after the business ourselves, but be able to help our colleagues who are properly trained for a particular case to be able to do that case. Deadly sin number five, ignorance of domestic violence. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because I know other people are as well. But the bottom line is you're not going to learn about domestic violence in one um, course or one CE workshop. Uh, you have to understand it. You have to be able to understand the literature, do reading in the area, uh, and educate yourselves in the effects of domestic violence because it's counterintuitive. Um, it is not what it looks like on the surface. And you have to really spend the time and understand what the typical uh, kinds of behaviors are. Uh, when I do my training, um, all of a sudden students look up and say, but, but, but Dr. Walker, these men all are saying the same thing or doing the same thing, and they don't know each other. How did that happen? Well. I suspect it happens because of our socialization um, uh, of, of people, um, not just our, our own family socialization uh, in our homes, but also our socialization in the media. Uh, and we're going to see a wonderful film tomorrow. Janet um, said it was today, but it's really tomorrow at lunchtime. Today you're going to be lunch on your own, but tomorrow you'll have lunch will be provided for you if you want to see the film. Um, okay. <laughs> and the misinterpretation of tests. Um, I can't tell you, they're giving the wrong test. MCMI tests are lovely because they're short and they're cheap to use and most people can read them, but the fact is they say clearly you're not supposed to give that test to anybody who doesn't already have a psychological problem and those of us who know the test know that it overdiagnoses pathology. So it should not be used in custody evaluations. Now they write all kinds of things saying it should because they're entrepreneurs and selling their tests. But the bottom line is uh, the tests that are being used in custody evaluations are poor. Um, all of them are poor, but some are better than others. Uh, and then not only do, you give, do we give wrong tests, but we also misinterpret the tests. Um, okay. Number six, deadly sin, is the fact that children have no legal standing in court. I don't think it's enough to just give them voice. I think they need to be represented by lawyers, not by guardian ad litems. The difference very quickly, uh, for those who don't know, is that most guardian ad litems are not lawyers. Some are, but they still, their responsibility is to protect the best interests of the child. Lawyers um, protect the child's wishes. Now, that doesn't mean the child's wishes are going to be granted, but it means the court will learn what the child's true wishes are. So the lawyer should be the person who has confidentiality, can protect the child, does not have to tell, as we have to, as we have the responsibility of reporting child abuse. And I haven't talked about the deadly sin of getting so many courts involved. You have the family court involved, then you have, have an a, a allegation of domestic violence and an allegation of child abuse, so you have 
a mandatory report. You have to report to dependency court in the larger cities. Then you find out that somebody has uh, been arrested for juvenile delinquency, so now you have a third court that's involved, and um, you have the father who may have assaulted the mother, so now you have criminal court involved. Um, there's been a, a movement towards unified family courts. I haven't found them to be particularly helpful, and I think that's because it does help you not have to go court, 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 um, and some of the judges are excellent who sit on the family court, but some of them are not, and so it comes right back to who's doing the work and whether they want to be there and not just assigned uh, to it. Um, uh, okay, and um, one of my very close friends uh, is a, Israel, a retired Israeli judge rewrote, she and her commission were appointed by the Israeli Supreme Court to rewrite every law in, in every one of their um, uh, rules of law to t look at it from children's perspective as well as the adults' perspective perspective. So once you give legal standing to children everywhere, they become a person and they have rights and they have their their perspective is an important perspective to keep in mind. She said the process took them about five or six years uh, to do it, uh, but uh, she claims that it does make a difference uh, in, in uh, what happens to the children there, although not enough to change everything, but it is a step. And then the last one is the bottom line. There are a few incentives to change the system. And we gotta find what incentives will get the system changing, get it moving. Um, uh, we've got to make sure that there's due process in the system. Uh, and we need the wonderful court watching that we have with advocates in some of our different communities. Unfortunately, many of the communities um, don't have court watchers, especially when you're going through, as Janet so aptly named it, um, uh, uh, family court hell. Um, because maybe you can climb out of it, but you're never not scarred by it. The scars are there, uh, and um, they, they, they are wrecking havoc on our population. Uh, when you, you uh, um, finally realize, uh, sometimes I think, you know, I've been doing this for almost 40 years. Why hasn't it changed? Well, I think one of the big reasons why it hasn't changed is that we are raising new generations of children that are scarred by abuse and by domestic violence. Go into the jails and in the prisons and uh, interview women. 85 to 90 percent of those women ha all have experienced trauma of one sort or another. Uh, many of them turn to substance abuse because of the trauma uh, that they have experienced. Many of them get themselves in trouble with the criminal courts because of the abusers uh, that they are with. Um, and go into death row and you won't find an inmate there who has not been abused in his life. So if we don't stop this um, uh, march on children's rights if we don't stop uh, the abuse that children are being put through in family court right at the beginning when they're very young. I don't believe we're going to be able to stop violence. And every time I gave a talk in the early days, I said, I really, really wish that violence will stop at some point in my lifetime. Well, I'm getting older, folks, so I think we got to really move it uh, if it's going to happen in my lifetime. Thank you very much. <laughs>